Now who knows all the one? Hands up. All of them. Hakan. All of Good. them. Good. Now, we want to ask a few questions. I don't know if, if we are ready. The question is, where did you sell your last car? Please go and enter the URL. Maybe they're collecting it. That's the Noah Berlin third question. If you save the URL, you just need to change the end of the number and do the voting with us. Because Hakan with Auto One has changed an entire industry. And when I say this, maybe there's a data point you can throw in. I remember you told me you are the largest car buyer in Europe. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So we buy uh, roughly 40,000 cars a month. 40,000 cars a month? What yeah. value is that? Uh, north of 200 million euros. Wow. And so what is your model? What is really Auto One doing? Because you came to a very large industry and you became a large player yourself by adding value to pretty much everyone. Maybe you can explain the model of Auto One a little bit. No, oh, of course, I'd love to. So, Auto One has started targeting the consumer. So, the first problem we wanted to solve was how do I sell my car? And let's face it, it was back in 2000. So, everyone was focused how to buy it. You were exactly. saying, okay, let's get them where they sell it. Exactly. <laughs> and it is not a transparent industry and it doesn't have the standards that we are used from e-commerce. Because when you think about it, 2012, c companies like Zalando were already good. You had your, you had your toll-free hotline, email support, customer first, everybody really doing everything for the customer. Website looks great. And uh, you really try to give everybody that experience. That was the e-commerce experience. And that was also our background. Yeah. And then you look at how do people sell cars, and it was totally different. There was no website. It was like if you, there were people putting business cards on your windshield, um, or you would just go to a dealership and wait, or you put it up on a classified and, and, and get a lot of, lot of noise and, and unsuccessful Get a full-time job selling it. Exactly. Uh, and most people already have a full-time job, so it's clashing. And so we thought, why is that the case? Why can't you just go online? book an appointment, go there in 30 minutes and be done. And uh, even if I have factors that make it an edge case, like I have a financed car, I don't actually have my title, I inherited the car. I mean, in the usual trade and in the dealerships, that is a challenge and people send the customer back and say, hey, you don't have the title. Go settle your loan, bring the title, and, and then I buy your car. Hey, you don't have a title on your name, your grandmother died, go to the German uh, administration, get it all changed, and so on and so on. And the question is, how much customer first can you put in that experience and really say, okay, if there are 20 edge cases, why don't I just solve for them? And when the customer comes, I can always serve them. Up to the point that, yes, you can have a financed car, and, uh, and we will settle the loan for you, fine. That already is, if you want so, very unique in the market. But let's say you don't even have enough money to settle that loan, so we also found a bank who will finance your gap interest-free. So always thinking of, if a customer walks in, he wants to sell his car, okay, done. Ah, he has a problem, okay, we solve that. Ah, he doesn't have money for that, okay, then we also solve that. And I think if you follow that path, then people have a good experience. And if they have a good experience, then they talk to their friends and their neighbors, and, and you just get the etiquette of being the problem solver. And uh, if you then apply e-commerce type of appreciation of your customer, then uh, I think that it really changed how people actually see your business. So, so you buy 40,000 cars a month. What are you doing with them? So we're all driving them around the block, of course, <laughs> <laughs> that's the <too hard. laughs> But uh, I will admit that in the beginning, I mean, we have a passion for cars. And of course, even in the first year, when you have very exotic models, and it doesn't have to be the Ferraris, even if it's, I don't know, a new Lada Niva, you were always like, okay, I need to drive this. Give me the keys. <laughs> and you just drive it around and, and, and try it all. Yeah? So there always has to be um, some fun. 
um, what we do with them is we supply the dealerships across Europe. So in our network, we have 35,000 dealers. This can be franchise dealers, like a BMW dealership. This can be branches operated by Daimler. This can be very big independent dealerships, but it can also be very, very small dealers. And all of them have a supply problem, because where do you get used cars? Yeah. And that is something that we also learned down the road. We had, of course, an idea that it's a problem but we didn't know that it is a major problem for the industry, how to source long tail used cars. So now we are their tier one supplier. I have dealers that joined us and they were trading 300 cars a year. And two years later, investors call them and say, how many cars do you trade now? And they say, now I trade 1,000. And I say, okay, and how many of those are auto one? And I say, 700. So the total net gain of this dealer's business is actually the supply that we brought to his table. Are you saving the dealerships? Yeah, I think the dealer is a very important part in the value chain because think about used cars. It's not comparable to new. If I tell you I have a 2012 Audi A4 diesel wagon, you know exactly which car I'm driving. You'll ask for the color and say, yeah, I have an idea. If I ask you now, do you want to buy it, you will say, wait a second, I haven't even seen the car. What about maintenance records? Does it have scratches? Do you actually smoke in your car? And so on and so on. So many, many uh, questions that are unanswered, and you need somebody who's the clearinghouse for that. And of course, buying a car is a very, very big asset. And when you look, especially in Germany, where you don't have so many homeowners, on average, it's the most expensive thing people own, which means that they will also need services, they will need financing, they want to know who's for, there for them, after they bought the car, what about after sales maintenance and so on. And all of this is being served by the dealer. Right. And I remember when you started, obviously, with Wir kaufen dein Auto in Germany, you very quickly went into other countries. I mm -hmm. think the model started in the UK. And it's one of those, if you look at Auto One, they didn't invent this, but they did it a lot better. So how come? you as a German player managed to get so big outside Germany. How did you conquer all these countries? I, I think, first of all, there's a big difference to UK player because we have built a product for both sides of the market. And what we've seen is that in the UK, there was somebody acquiring a lot of cars, but then pushing it to very traditional offline auctions where people have to actually go and physically bid on the cars and... So they didn't um, do the clearinghouse connecting all the European dealers yeah. to get the cars easily. How long you hold the car on average? 10 days. 10 days on average. And then you have a little markup. Yeah. So international growth, how did you do it? Did you lose, use local people or you send people from Germany to the countries out? What's, what's the advice for all the growing international businesses here? I, I think you really need to have figured out your processes. And Auto One today is a very international company, but it rolled out actually one and a half years after we founded the company. So really uh, 13, 14 months, this was a German-only company. And we've brought it down to a point where we knew exactly how does a branch have to look, who do we want in our team, how do we supply it? What is actually, what do you need as backup solutions? And when then it gets a very, very long list. And when you have that list, then of course you, you need to empower people on the ground. So we always took locals um, and, and, uh, and, and country managers um, that have the same ambition, you know, if you want to also own us of the business. But we gave them a playbook and say, hey, these are all the mistakes that we made in Germany. And um, if you're lucky, you won't have to make them. Right. So the consumers love it. They can sell their car without following Autoscout or Mobility or all these things consistently. Uh, the dealers love it because they find the odd car somebody happens to want. What do the OEMs, the manufacturers, say about what you do? Because they have their OEM franchise networks, do they feel threatened by you? Um, have they partnered with you? Where is that standing? No, I think the OEMs uh, um, um, are, are partners, and uh, we're in contact actually with all of them. Everyone has their own challenges, 
I think what you cannot expect as a startup is come and change their agenda. An OEM trade is part of their business. Their electric vehicles and there's the Chinese market. And I mean, when, when, when you talk to OEM people, uh, then they have 500 problems that are as important as what you're trying But to solve. But didn't them. we, last year we talked about if you reduce the average holding time of a car per dealer for the industry in, in Europe, they save like 30 million. And obviously with your solution, they don't have to hold the car at all. It's like Japanese just-in-time delivery. <laughs> Isn't that for them the biggest motivator to work with you? Oh, absolutely. So what we, uh, what we have integrated with OEMs, but also with dealers is we empower them with our software. So in the beginning when we said we're buying those cars, we have our trained employees, they have our iPad, they have our 150 points check, and say, okay, this is how Audubon buys cars. We measure the paint thickness and really normalize the car, like in your finance language, securitize it, yeah? make it really tradable. And then why wouldn't they be able to do it? These are car experts. They have their mechanics, they have their... Uh, uh, p people who look at cars every day. So we said, we can give you the software. That's not an issue. And, and that is actually how you win, if you want, so the hearts of OEMs is sharing a little bit of this technological edge that you have. You will not have... Making them a little bit more competitive on the digital side. Basically. Yeah, because at the end of the day, they also need to make their customer happy. And when is their customer happy uh, is actually very simple, when they pay them a good price. And how to pay a good price is you need liquidity and a big network. Now, when you go to an OEM dealership, they don't have 35,000 dealers waiting for exactly that trade. -in. No, usually a Mercedes cannot trade in a BMW and yeah, you solve that. Yeah, it would be problem. very punitive pricing. Um, and we do, we, we do see that they want to sell to us, um, and um, we do partner on, in, on several locations with them. Yeah? And, and one of the most innovative uh, is actually BMW. It's a very... Um, That's your uh, first uh, OEM partner? It's, yeah, it's, it, it's the people who are very curious about it and perhaps also say, okay, let's just make that move. Yeah. And when, what you see, and if you want so, be my advice to very big corporations, if you give people a little leeway and say, we we'll try this out now, we're not committed for the next five years, we're not doing this, then bottom up from the organization, people feel that they are allowed to also try out things. So when you start and do at OEM headquarter level, some partnerships to say, let's just try this out and say, yeah, that's fine, let's do it. You see how dealerships and other branches start calling you and say, hey, we saw that our big bosses are doing that with you, so why couldn't we do it with you? And uh, then it gets really interesting because now it's, if you want, so a self-supporting cycle where they say, okay, this is a good thing, now I also want this. And um, th the first step was a very small one, but uh, just by being a little open to new things without checking the whole legal department and how does it mess with our CI and uh, which color should they use and God knows what. There are many questions that you can ask and there are many answers why you shouldn't do anything. But uh, at the end of the day, I mean, if you want to do business, you need to go that one extra risky step ahead yeah? and then you can, you can grow. Last question, do you own any Bitcoin? <laughs> um, no. Good. Me neither. So let's see what the poll is saying. Where did you sell your last car? Opinary, please bring up the results. Online classified, traditional diesel, and other. I see us in the two of them. <laughs> well, let's say 66, or 76. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you so much. Right. Hakan, Thanks. thank you very much for coming. Thank you.